my name is Jessica, and I'm a Jack.org speaker. I'm Alexia, and I'm an indi- I'm the Indigenous lead with Jack.org. If you guys are not familiar with Jack.org, they're a Canadian youth mental health charity, and they work on mental health education, mental health awareness, and mental health advocacy in the community. And before I move forward, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that the land that I am on is that of this Pierre Robinson Treaty, as well as of the people of the Anishinaabe. And I want to take a minute and recognize uh, not only their attachment to this land, but also appreciate the stewardship that they have had over this land uh, for a very long time, as well as that of the Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples of Canada, um, and how they have both had a role in shaping and strengthening the communities uh, across Canada. And I think while we're here to talk about mental health today, it's very important to discuss how the impacts of mental health in relation to Indigenous folks um, have had a lot of different factors that have influenced it from negligent resource extraction to discrimination to intergenerational trauma. um, And we'll dive in a bit further later on. Awesome, thanks Jess. Um, I wanted to take a moment as well um, and acknowledge that as a Mi'kmaq woman, I am a visitor on the ancestral, unceded, and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Nation. Um, I have a lot of like relationships with um, the land that I live on, and I'm so, so grateful, um, much like you said, just to the stewards of the land that I'm on, um, because Algonquin territory, in my very biased perspective, is some of the most beautiful territory across Turtle Island. Um, we really do have it all between like lakes, rivers, mountains, trees, forests. Um, and I'm really grateful to get to, to call this place home um, as a First Nation person who's been displaced to this land as a result, like you said, of intergenerational trauma and residential schools. Um, and I'm really excited to be here today talking about mental health Um, from my Indigenous perspective, because I think, like you mentioned, Jess, um, there's been a lot of disparities over the years that Indigenous folks have had to face. Um, And I'm excited to have this platform to talk to Indigenous youth and to non-Indigenous youth, um, and just kind of, I guess, level out that playing field and get sort of a baseline understanding of, of what mental health is and how it looks very different for different folks with different experiences. So I don't know. So I guess getting right into it, I can start and just acknowledge that again, like as somebody who lives in um, in Ottawa, which is like the colonial name, um, I've actually had in my experience, like a lot of mental health services that have kind of been like directed or thrown at me. But as an Indigenous person, I haven't felt a real big sense of connection to any of them nor have I seen myself really represented in them. Um, Especially too, growing up, like uh, funds weren't always available to me and my family to access those services. And the services that had, you know, free services or a couple of sessions for free with counselors, the wait lists were always so long that by the time I was kind of available, by the time someone was available to see me, the mental health crisis or problem that I was going through had kind of subsided or I'd had to find different ways to cope with that and so I say that because I feel like there's a really big juxtaposition between southern southern indigenous experience and urban indigenous experience where we have perhaps like many more resources at our fingertips for mental health services but they're not always easily accessible and they're definitely not culturally safe or relevant compared to like the northern experience or more rural or even reserve based experiences where they might have more access to cultural understandings and teachings that help support a journey of mental wellness, but they have less resources available to be coupled with that, if that kind of makes sense. I was going to say on that, Alexia, I know up here, um, even for income based counseling, where you know it matches up with your income it's at least a year to two year waiting list uh, if it's not also for free counseling Um, and that you know puts a lot of people at a disadvantage um, because they're not really able to seek that help when they're struggling and so then they might not be able to really get better yeah and i think it's 
no matter which way you kind of slice it, you know, like we've looked at now my Southern slash urban experience. And you've talked about this experience in the North, which is so similar to even like Southern remote indigenous communities. Um, is just that even though there are services that you can theoretically access, like practically it's a much, much different story. Um, and I think that contributes overall so much to um, like our mental health lens and framework with which we understand mental health. Um, so for me growing up and, you know, we kind of both touched on it, um, intergenerational trauma played like a huge factor in that. Um, I remember really distinctly, like I'll share a little anecdote here. Um, I was in the fifth grade and we had like a culture day at my school and we got to decorate like a culture box and bring it in and share it and show it off to our peers. And I was so proud of getting to say back when I was in school, like we still referred to indigenous folks as Aboriginal. And so I was identifying as that. Um, and the questions that I got from my peers, which were so heavily influenced by ongoing colonial violence with like education systems leaving out largely the history of trauma done to indigenous folks the questions that i got were like i didn't know you were poor alexia or like i didn't know like do your parents drink a lot do they smoke and all of these questions were just like in my classmates minds they were tied like so interconnectedly to my indigenous culture that as like a 10 year old kid i was like okay, I'm done with this. Like, I don't want to identify in this way anymore. And it took like years and years of self-practice and self-research, like outside of the school system to help me reconnect to that identity. Um, and at the same time, like my mom and sister were going through their own reconnection to identity and understanding different things. My grandfather is struggling with dementia now It's and it's only through his um, dementia state kind of rambling that he started to talk about his family members being taken away to residential schools. And we're not talking, you know, uh, more than two, like this was two generations ago in my family. Um, and so that intergenerational trauma took what I think could have been mental health problems that I struggled with in high school and turned it into like sort of ongoing mental illness that represents or sorry that not represents presents in me in like an ongoing battle with anxiety and an ongoing battle with depression and there is no real removal of that experience from my indigenous background mm -hmm. and i know when we're talking about all this from an outsider's perspective i've constantly throughout my whole life been witness to a lot of discrimination going on for a lot of the same reasons that you said yourself. A lot of the stereotypes um, that we have up here as well, uh, specifically because we do have a very uh, big portion of Indigenous folks in my community. And so um, I know for you that that's how that's presented. And I know talking about that, you can also sort of put that maybe on the spectrum of mental health and sort of how that plays out. Um, with the fact that you do have a mental illness, but that you're able really to maybe have a positive mental health with seeking, you know, whether it's medication or self-care. Um, I don't know what specifically you use to manage your mental illness. Yeah, I think it's a lot. A lot of it honestly goes back to seeking out ways that I can identify and connect with my culture in a healthy way. Um, and so I... Um, my medicines are really important to me. So like including like daily smudging is so important to me because culturally, like what we're saying when we smudge, depending on the medicines that you're using, um, I tend to use um, sage and sweetgrass. And sage is like incredibly grounding um, and really roots you in like the here and the now and gets rid of like that mental kind of fogginess that comes with, with mental illness. Um, and then of course, like the sweetgrass, um, according to teachings is, you know, the hair of mother earth. And so when it's braided too, like it reminds us of like the connection between mind, body and spirit and how we have to work at each of those to make sure that they're all strong because if one is not strong, the rest will also follow. Um, and the, the last kind of really beautiful teaching behind sweet grass is that it reminds us of mother earth's like unconditional love for us. And I think for me on like my hardest days, um, where 
on that kind of spectrum of, of mental health, I'm a little bit lower than I usually am. Um, those are really good reminders that I can fall back on. And so it's been largely about reconnecting to culture and finding safe ways to do that, that have been super helpful for me in managing like the ongoing challenge of anxiety and depression. I know personally, um, I can't relate really um, much on the front of a diagnosed mental illness. I know that when I've struggled with my mental health, it's been due to a lot of uh, lived experiences that I've had. Um, so for me, losing a parent was one of the biggest things. Um, and then after that, following that, you know, taking care of my sister um, uh, and all those changes and all those responsibilities that sort of came with it. Uh, at some point, I really needed to reach out for help to sort of get back to a um, sane place with my mental health. And so I think those are two really distinct experiences right there. And they really showcase how someone can be on one side of a spectrum and someone can be on the other side. Thank you for sharing that, Jess. And I think like a question that I have, um, because I find a lot of comfort in that like cultural perspective that I can fall back on. But when you were looking for, or when you were, were doing that initial outreach of looking for help, um, how did you start that process? I'll be honest. Um, it's a very different um, process because I wasn't really seeking help at the time. I was sort of supporting a friend who was going to a workshop. And it was through that that I met someone that I sort of connected with just because we had sort of gone through a same experience in that um, in that few, those few weeks. Um, but I know that you know, for me, the first point of contact was my school. And that's just because they do offer same day counseling, which means if you're calling early in the morning, you're probably going to be able to talk to someone um, versus having to wait a few weeks or having to wait over a year uh, for something in the community. I think what's interesting to me about like hearing, you know, your story and knowing my own story is that even though like the root causes of our struggles are like so, so different. Um, there was like a shared commonality and, and you said it too, was like that initial connection. Um, and you know, like your connection was to a peer going through a same situation or a similar situation who was able to contact you, just making those initial connections. And it's kind of like, you know, understanding that while those root causes are so different, um, the way that it can show up at least is, can be very similar. You know, like I know that feeling of like isolation is very shared, like it's very common, like no matter what our backgrounds are, no matter if, you know, like my Southern experience, your Northern experience, your mental health experience versus my mental illness experience, we both touched on the fact that finding that connection and sharing that struggle was so important. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, well, maybe not everyone has mental illness, um, everyone has mental health. And it's really important that we sort of take care of our mental health through whatever means really that work for us. And, you know, whether that's counseling like I've done, or whether that's, you know, practicing self care, or um, DBT or CBT skills, for example, uh, just making sure that you're always being self aware and taking care of yourself in that manner. I think that's so interesting too, like that it's almost like we have to spend a bit of time experimenting with what's going to work best for us. And I think that's something that I wish someone had told like a younger version of Alexia, like just because you run into one barrier with like access to services doesn't mean that you, you know, should stop seeking that support. It just means that you can approach it in a different way. Um, yeah, that's just something really interesting that's kind of resonating with me as we talk. I think also what was really interesting was also just pulling with your experiences and how those are really like social determinants for people who might like struggle with their mental health. And I know that there's so many more. Um, and so I thought we could just maybe start off with some that like touch the individual itself, maybe. Absolutely. I think... Yeah, that's like such a good place to start because the social social determinants of health are so interesting. And so my background is in developmental psychology. So 
when I think of things like statistics, and a lot of the time we refer to statistics to talk about mental health. So, you know, one statistic is that we say one in five Canadians are going to struggle with mental health. But when we look at that statistic, what it's actually doing is looking at like the normative curve. Um, and in that normative curve, there's the majority of the population. But the issue with the statistics is that it always leaves out outliers because it's only looking at that normative group. Um, and so I think when we discuss, when we discuss, you know, the, the other members that are struggling with mental health that maybe don't fall into that one in five or that are not able to seek out support like counseling services that would kind of get them added to those statistics list. I think a lot of the times we can refer back to and look at the social determinants of health and likely I think we're going to see patterns there. Um, we've touched on a couple like with Indigenous mental health. A huge one is just working through intergenerational trauma. And one thing that I always say when I worked with youth in the past, and when I was a youth, I was coming to this understanding myself. And it took me being removed from the education system to truly understand it. Um, and one thing that I encourage teachers to remember is that um, there's more and more research and science going into the study of like blood memory and blood trauma and what we remember from our ancestors that doesn't like show up in a in a gene test necessarily um but a big one for indigenous folks is that our first experiences with westernized version of education was through residential schools and so when you have youth that are struggling in school are we taking enough of a step back to understand that their family members might have experienced residential school and that could be like a really deeply rooted and ingrained trigger when they're struggling with their homework and falling behind with their peers, are they going home to parents who are able to help them with their homework or are they also still traumatized from a family members or their own experience with residential schools? Like we know that the last residential school only closed in the 90s. That's not that long ago. I was born in the 90s. Um, you know, my, my, my family, my parents' generation was lucky enough not to be brought into residential schools but it's just it's still only two generations away from me like my grandparents experienced that they lived through that and um those are things that i think when we look at again that normative curve of understanding who's experiencing mental health issues it's so important that we remember to take a step back and look at that bigger picture and and those determinants are there any others that i guess like speak to you Jess, or that you seem to notice as being sort of ever present for yourself or for your peers? I know personally for me, loved experiences is a big one. And being someone who's like in university setting, you do see maybe like people who may abuse of substance a bit too much. Um, and they may not realize it either. And that could also be part of trying to cope with their trauma and everything that they've gone through. I think, you know, another one uh, that I listed as well is just discrimination um, and stereotypes being very rampant up here in my community and how those have really affected individuals. Um, you know, whether that means that now they have a fear of even accessing uh, medicine or going to the hospital for fear of discrimination or mistreatment, or whether that's even just going to the grocery store and not wanting to be discriminated there. Um, and then again, seeking, you know, mental help especially if uh, it's a service that isn't uh, in connection with their culture, uh, can be very difficult for the fact that they may not feel very trustworthy towards these individuals. I think those are great points. And I think, you know, obviously we could have like, you know, an hours long discussion on, on social determinants of mental health and social determinants of health. Um, and even looking at how, you know, that is related, like your physical health that you have access to doctors for physical care, like that can really turn around and impact mental health as well. So I think like that part of the conversation could just last forever, like if, if we wanted it to. And um, it's kind of unfortunate that it could because that's, you know, that speaks to a, a huge need across Turtle Island to address those inequities. Um, but I think it's interesting when we look at the social determinants of health, um, I think that there would be a lot of linkages back to 
you know, the social determinants of mental health that are impacting you and where you find yourself fitting on that spectrum of mental health that we discussed. Um, and in our conversation, we kind of touched on that. I have like deeply ingrained intergenerational determinants of, of health of and my mental health and the access to services and the discrimination and, and those things that we mentioned and those put me on the side of mental illness needing to have ongoing support. Um, so yeah, I, I just, all that to say is that I think it, it, it's really interesting how those social determinants really interconnect with our placement on that spectrum. If we're gonna be doing that activity and understanding where we are on that spectrum, it's so important to realize that sometimes you can have like the best upbringing and I definitely have like the best support network. I have, you know, my, my mom and my sister, I'm so lucky to continue to live with them. Um, which is also like a cultural understanding that families tend to stay together in like more collectivist communities. Um, and they've been like amazing supports and yet I still have these struggles. So it's important to just remember that sometimes mental health is, you know, not just because, and I remember hearing this growing up, like you're not trying hard enough to kind of shake the feelings, you know, like, you know, cheer up, like think of the positive, someone always has it worse for you. And those are hugely detrimental because that leads to a lot of self stigmatization. Um, and so I think that's also interesting to just include. Um, and maybe as we move into the next section about being there for ourselves, self stigmatization as a part of social determinants of mental health can be kind of thematic through that. No, for sure. And I think one of the first things in regards to being there for yourself and really realizing if we're doing it is being self-aware. And that can be a bit of a challenge for individuals. Um, sometimes we have to sort of think back and ask ourselves, like, what does it look like when I feel unwell? And like in the past when I felt unwell, like what, you know, did I do? Did I isolate myself from my peers? Did I lack on some maybe the hygiene habits that I should have had? you know, was my room a huge mess for weeks on end, but just looking and seeing sort of what makes uh, or what it looks like when we feel unwell sort of helps us um, know when we're struggling. And when we know when we're struggling, that also helps us be a bit more compassionate to ourselves because we can think, oh, well, you know, it's such a small thing or what I'm dealing with isn't that big. But when we take a step back and say, no, look, it's having an effect on me. Like I need to be compassionate to myself. I need to take some time for myself to take care of myself so I can get better. Um, then we can hopefully get rid of some self stigma. Yeah, I think it's so, it's so interesting because a question that I like to ask myself really frequently, um, when I find myself being really hard on myself, like there are some days where I'm like, gosh, Alexia, you know, like just, deal with it like get up get over it you know like you said like I think the the tidiness is one that super impacts me like I I know that about myself I can take a look at my bedroom and and know if I'm not in a mentally great space because it looks like a disaster zone um and so often in those times I'm like oh this is so gross like why have I let it get this bad in my space um but a question that I've been trying to learn to ask myself more is, you know, if a friend, if you came to me, Jess, and said like, oh, you know, I've really been struggling lately and my room's a disaster and, you know, it's just, it's gross in there. I wouldn't ever be like, well, have you considered getting over it and just cleaning your space? Like, no, I would offer you so much more compassion. So I think in those moments too, when we recognize that we're not doing the best we've ever done mentally, it's so important to just remember like, treat yourself with kindness and gentleness the same way that you would treat your treat a friend who's going through something because again like I would never take that tone with you in the same way that I take it with myself for sure I know um you know talking about really being there for ourselves as well not only is it important to make sure that we're not self-stigmatizing it's also important to make sure that we're doing everything in our possible power to like make sure that even our body's needs are met because those tend to be some of the first ones that go we may forget uh to hydrate or get that sleep or even exercise one of for me like the first things that i can notice is going to alter if i'm really struggling is my exercise is going to go down um mm -hmm. 
and, and so I can look back at the year and be like, oh, you know, in my app, right? Because I have an app that tracks things. Oh, well, I was doing really good here. And like here I was really struggling. And so um, I think really making sure that you're keeping up with your body's needs as well. And in terms of self-stigmatizing as well, also making sure that we have a positive self-esteem is very important. Um, and not thinking really low of ourselves or thinking that, no, we have to change and that we're doing it wrong. Um, so I know a lot of different ways that we can go about that is following, I think, what we call the three C's at Jack.org. So that's community, um, which the first is the C. And so that's really about connecting with individuals, whether that's through volunteer work or being part of a club or whether that's your family or friends. Um, the second one is having a sense of control in your life. And that can be very hard, especially for us as youth sometimes. But maybe if it's control over your space um, or even some people, they'll find making a to-do list and doing those things every day, a sense of control that they have. And then the last one uh, is all about competence. And so doing something that you're good at. So whether you're good at art or whether you know, you're know you good at um, playing the piano, whatever sort of works for you and really boosting that self-esteem too so that we're not always thinking I could be doing better but having the sense of no, I'm doing as well as I can. And I know that like, I think highly of myself too and that helps support my mental health. I think, oh gosh, I agree with that so much. And I think when we, maybe first start working on those three C's, it's really, really hard. Um, like I know when I first started really experiencing the symptoms of my mental mental health and mental illness struggles, like connecting was really hard. Finding things that made me feel confident was really, really hard. Um, and having control over things was like the hardest of all three because I felt like I was losing control over absolutely everything. But I think the more that we practice at it, the more those actually become ingrained as really good healthy coping mechanisms so I love what you said about art you know like if you're competent with art um and you start getting into the habit of just like oh you know I've had a gross day I'm gonna like quickly do a sketch or quickly paint um I find that becomes really part of the routine so that when you start to notice oh, I'm having a bad time, one of your first thoughts is like going to that art perspective. And in doing that and having that thing that you're, you feel confident and competent with, um, you're actually building really healthy coping skills. Um, and I think too, the hardest thing about recognizing, you know, the signs of a mental health struggle or a mental illness, like ongoing struggle is being able to reach out for help. And that comes from a lot of the self stigma that we just talked about, but also a lot of social stigma, which I'm really excited to see, like, since I was a teenager, I'm a little bit outside of that age now. Um, but we've gotten so much better at that as a society, like, which is so like positive and uplifting and really good to see. And I hope that trajectory really continues because it's so much easier to be there for yourself when you know that you're not going to get judged for it or bullied for it or when you put up boundaries which I think boundaries are so important for mental health just knowing when to say no to different things or knowing to say like my social battery is really low you know thanks for the offer to hang out I have to pass this time and giving yourself that space like that is also a way of taking control like I felt when I first started struggling that when I was saying no to these things I was losing control but actually saying no and respecting those boundaries for myself, not all the time, because again, that's isolating, but finding that balance between isolation and downtime, like alone downtime to recharge was really important for me. So I love that you brought up those three C's because I think they do such a good job at like combating self stigmatization and combating negative coping skills and just overall really working towards addressing ongoing mental health challenges and making sure that we're prepared the next time we hit a struggle moment. For sure and I think you know we're talking a lot about being there for ourselves but we also have to talk about being there for others um, and I think that's really important especially you know in today's society also like how do we approach that as youth 
uh, how do we feel comfortable enough and feel like we're doing the right thing? Um, especially if, you know, we have someone who we're not super close with, it can be a bit of a challenge. And I think one of the first things and one of the most important things is to remember um, to really just say what you see and to not be judgmental or to not make assumptions um, and really just be open uh, so that the person's maybe very comfortable and can also maybe say maybe that they're not really struggling and that that, you know, was an offhand incident. Um, and maybe also give them the opportunity to say, no, I am struggling if they feel comfortable enough. Yeah. And I think even if in those situations, someone is not feeling comfortable enough in that moment to say, yeah, I'm struggling. Um, having somebody reach out can make the world of difference. Um, it can just let you know that you're being seen by somebody. Um, and I know in, in Indigenous communities and, and from what I've seen both like as a youth and now someone who works with youth, um, that is so important, like to be able to be there for others. Um, in, in my community, like a, a lot of youth see me as like an anti-figure and that is like, that is so empowering and so important. It like not only helps my mental health, but it lets youth know in the community that I am like a safe person to go to. And so those initial couple times that I think you try and be there for others can be kind of nerve wracking. Like you don't want to do the wrong thing. You don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, but in my perspective, the most wrong you can ever do is by saying nothing at all and not reaching out when you think somebody might be struggling. And yeah, like you said, saying what you see doesn't mean hey, Jess, I think you're mentally struggling. It's, hey, Jess, this is a behavior that I see. Is everything okay? And it's really objective, which I think is so important because we don't want to self-project onto somebody. Um, like you said, like isolated incidents. If I happen to notice, like, you know, if, if I was over visiting you at your house, <laughs> like, and I noticed your room was a mess. If I say, hey, are you mentally struggling? Your room's a mess. That might not at all be the case for you just because it's the case for me. So yeah, just being objective in those observations and and saying what you see, I think is like, we, we say it so nicely here at jack.org, just say what you see um, and reach out and and don't don't be afraid to say or do the wrong thing so long as you're being objective and it's coming from that place of care. And I think branching off of that, especially you we touched on sort of like showing really that you care, I think is also super important because we don't want people to feel like off put. We want them to feel like, no, we're there. We're bringing it up because we care. We care about mm -hmm. them and their mental health. And whether that's giving someone a hug or just telling them that you do care about them or their well-being um, is really important. And then really after that, being in the moment, listening to them, sort of taking a back seat and seeing how they respond. Um, if they feel like they wanna open up, if they don't feel like they wanna open up, you can even see if there's someone else that they'd rather connect to or they would feel comfortable opening up. Um, I know a lot of youth tend to say, you know, I'm there if you always wanna listen uh, or you want someone to talk to. And that's a great thing that people can do. Um, but if you are lucky and someone is comfortable opening up, um, then also making sure, right, that as youth specifically too, we're not playing like a psychiatrist or a counselor, like that's not yeah. really the role here. The role is really just to connect them with the help they need. So whether that's, you know, calling like a crisis line together or whether that's driving them to a counselor's appointment and, you know, making sure that we follow up too. And we say like, you know, how are things going? Do you need help finding something else that really fits better? Yeah, I think, and as you were, you were speaking and saying, you know, making sure that you're listening, that you're taking the back seat. Um, I'm reminded of a teaching, and this isn't the same across Canada, of course, like there are so many diverse cultures across Indigenous communities in Canada. Um, but a teaching that I've grown up with is, is based on the seven grandfather teachings. And one of those seven grandfather teachings is to always walk with humility. Um, and that to me is so important, especially in our role as peer supports. Like you said, we are not psychiatrists. So you shouldn't take from this experience, like I am this person's one and only savior. Like that's not your job. And it, you need to remind yourself that you're not a trained professional and that 
just because you want to help doesn't mean that you're going to do the most good in your role. If you're trying to play a role that's not yours, like a counselor, a psychiatrist, you really need to practice humility and say like, what is my role in this? And our role as youth is to be there for each other um, and to be there without judgment and to be there openly and candidly and honestly, which is honesty is another grandfather teaching. And you have to be honest with someone to say, I don't know how to help you through all of this, but can I find ways and other people that can't? Um, and that's that balance between being humble in the moment and not thinking that you're going to save, you're going to be someone's savior um, and, and being honest with them about like your own capacity and your own boundaries. Um, because two mentally ill people trying to help each other can really quickly spiral into maladaptive practices. Um, and just instead of supporting each other to get help, you're more supporting those bad coping skills or the ones that we want to kind of work at eliminating to work towards healthier ones. So just being honest with yourself is so important to me, at least um, when we're talking about peer to peer support at a youth level. And I think, you know, all of that is even more important and really needs to be emphasized when we're talking about a peer supporting another peer who's in a crisis. Um, it might not be something that everyone will um, have to deal with or not have to deal with, but will be presented with. And it can be a very difficult, uh, challenging scenario. I know personally, I was sort of in uh, the shoes of not knowing what to do when a friend disclosed um, plans to act on something. And for me, it took a lot of courage to say, as much as my friend doesn't want me to sort of speak up and, you know, it might feel like a violation of trust in the relationship, their health is really the priority here. And so reaching out to, um, for me, it was a mental health nurse at school. For someone else, it would probably be, uh, you know, whether um, it's a hospital or a CMHA mobile crisis unit. Um, and if someone was comfortable, maybe the police would be a last resort. But making sure that you know that person really gets that help and then after that making sure that you get the help that you need yeah and I think there are like just as you touched on that there are so many of the the different grandfather teachings that we could um get into and um you know we we we're gonna be providing like a whole bunch of different resources and a toolkit to kind of go along with the chat that we're having today um but also at its core, I think, is like a lot of love, um, which is another one of those teachings. And I think sometimes the hardest thing, and you touched on it, like if you have a friend who doesn't want you to be reaching out, but you know that they're in a crisis, the biggest and most selfless act of love that you can do is by calling that support. Um, I've also been in situations like that too, Jess, where I'm, I, I've had to say to someone like, I know you're going to be angry with me about this but I love you enough to let you be angry at me. Um, because yeah, you never want to, again, make the mistake of not speaking up when you should. Um, and I think one of the last things that I want to say is that um, youth have so much power and so much, like so much power in their voices and the actions that they can create. And we see this across Turtle Island, but there are so many cool, uh, youth doing just amazing things and so one thing that I want to leave folks that are watching us today with is that if this is a conversation that you've enjoyed participating in and listening to um, please get into contact uh, with myself um, my email will be in that list of resources um, because Jess is one of our lovely speakers and we would love to have more of you step into this role um, working with Jess I can say it's been fantastic um, and Jess is a youth just like me, just like you, who has power in, in her voice and wants to be sharing different resources. So you can become a Jack Talk speaker. Um, if you want, you can be starting up Jack chapters to do mental health initiatives and events and activities in your community that you know are gonna fit the needs of you and your peers. And I think that kind of empowerment and um, yeah, just that kind of empowerment is so good um, to have as youth because I really believe that youth can make the best difference 
Um, I'm gonna leave off with like one one last teaching and then Jess, I'll pass her to you to, to close us out. Um, but one other big teaching we have um, is the seven generations principle. Um, and that principle is that everything that I do today is gonna really be seen in the seven generations that will follow, that will follow me. Um, so if I do bad things, then bad things will transpire in those seven generations. But if I'm doing good things and I'm working at helping community and I'm working on my own mental illness and challenging it and breaking patterns of intergenerational trauma, I can stop that with me so that the next seven generations are not filled with intergenerational trauma. They're filled with inter intergenerational joy and love. And that to me is really important. It's why I do this work. And yeah, I just want to thank everybody for for being here today and um, joining together for the Moosehide Campaign Day. It's such an important day. And Jess, anything that you want to close us out with? I think I just wanted um, to mention something that I think is quite important and that I've struggled with a lot as someone who is a youth and dealing with disclosures is really understanding the line of when do I sort of have to reach out to an emergency support for someone. Um, and really, I think we have to remind ourselves that there are a lot of youth that deal with thoughts regarding suicide uh, or self harm. And when we're talking about someone who has a plan and someone who has means to those plans, that's really um, where we need to make sure that we reach out to those emergency contacts. Um, and so really off of that, uh, as Alexia mentioned, um, I'm a Dr. Rick speaker, and that's one of the things that I really love to do um, in my time to volunteer. And as much as sometimes also I'm doing talks where there's hundreds of people, I'm also sometimes doing talks where there's 10 people. And I think what's really important there is that sometimes, you know, well, it can feel like you're not making much of a difference in your community, you're making a bigger difference than you realize. And having those one-on-one -on -one connections with youth is very important. And so I encourage you to interact with your community in any way that you can, and to really be there for other youth, even if sometimes it can feel a bit discouraging, um, because I guarantee you it's very meaningful uh, for those individuals. And so, uh, as Alexia said, I really want to thank everyone for listening. Um, and really celebrating this important uh, campaign that we have today. Awesome. Thank you, Chimi Kwech, everybody.